Hey, it's close personal friend Lou Brutus. Mark LaBelle of Dirty Honey joins me from beautiful, rainy Los Angeles. Great to see you. How you been? I'm hanging in there. How you doing? You know, uh, considering the circumstances we still find ourselves living in, I'll take it. Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely people that are worse off at the moment. But uh, yeah, man, I'm pretty excited. It's just it's it's kind of an interesting time right now. We just dropped a single and there's no shows to do. It's very it's a strange you're very antsy, you know, and uh, just itching to get on the road and, and play for some people again. And, you know, I think as bad as the pandemic is, and I'm not, not saying it's a good thing, but you guys, I think, were able to make the best of pandemic downtime when it came time to uh, create new music and uh, get it done. Why don't you kind of walk me through the last year? Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting time. We finished a tour um, February 28th of 2020. Um, we finished at the El Rey and then, it was about two and a half weeks later, we were going to be going back to Australia to record with Nick to Dia again. And that was sort of right when the shit hit the fan, you know, with this whole situation and we had to cancel that and went back to the drawing board, tried to figure out a couple other things. And ultimately we decided to do it in LA with Nick via zoom with a great engineer and Tom Sarowski. He engineers for like Brendan O'Brien all the time. And, Um, he was, he was awesome. Our, uh, manager's assistant, Owen, um, really helped out with the logistics of getting everything to work, like in the studio, getting the TV to broadcast Nick's feed, uh, having mics set up. So everybody had a talk back. Um, and, you know, leading up to, to going into the studio, we, you know, we ultimately wrote and and made what is now a much better record. So, um, use the time. I wouldn't say as, as best as we possibly could have and really haven't since recording. I think everybody uh, got a little burned out, but um, now that we're getting a little bit closer to seeing the end, I think we're, we're starting to meet up again and rehearse and write. And, you know, everybody's got a new batch of ideas that they've been working on since we finished the last one. So. Have you found that studio energy is different under these circumstances? Uh, Just really, honestly, walking in, you had to have a mask on. And then once you got into your world, you know, um, it's, you know, however comfortable you want to be, you can, you can be, and everybody's really respectful. It it was at Henson studios here in LA, which, you know, Justin Bieber was in one room, John Mayer's in another room, Billy Bob Thornton and his band were in another room. Um, you know, and, and they had a really good communal, uh, sort of dining area for everybody, but it was socially distanced and you could, you know, chop it up with whoever you wanted. And, and everybody was cool and respectful. And it was really nice to, to be in this little oasis during this crazy time and and being productive. Um, but the energy was, was fine. It was totally cool. What's Billy Bob Thornton eat for lunch at a session? (laughs) They had uh, some sort of catering set up. Um, he had some good stories. He had some good stories. He's toured with some cool people, but, uh, he was super nice man. And, and was, uh, excited to hear what we were up to and, and, and likewise for us with him too. So it was, uh, it was just a random, uh, you know, holy shit, it's Billy Bob Thornton. You know what I mean? Uh, but he was really cool. So we had a, we had a blast talking with him and, and with John Mayer too, for a little bit. Um, yeah, it just, it, it just helped feel normal, you know, when you're not really supposed to. And a quick aside for, for folks who might shake their heads a little bit, Billy Bob Thornton is an incredible musician. Uh, and I should also add that John Mayer, if anybody had any doubts, uh, yeah. should watch him play guitar with Dead & Company, the, uh, the Post Grateful Dead project, because that guy is an insane guitar player, one of the best out there. So Yeah, and a great songwriter, too. And, um, you know, he's just one of those, he's kind of like, the guitar player of the last couple decades, I guess, for, for a younger audience, you know, um, not certainly not in like the rock and roll world, but, but I think, uh, you know, he's doing something that's definitely worth appreciating and he's a true artist. So, um, yeah, he, and, and he was super nice too. So. And again, how do you keep up on music? Because uh, you and everybody else in the band have struck me as people who certainly have an understanding of current rock and a very deep understanding of previous generations of rock. But I always hear little textures in there of 
other things. I hear old R and B textures in there, and I hear some old Definitely. soul things. Just, just little bits and pieces, and maybe I'm imagining. But there seems to be a whole amalgam of different things in there. How do you keep up on it all? How do you learn it all? Yeah, uh, there's not a ton of. I mean, the newest stuff, honestly, that that I've been really interested in. I just took a dive last night. Uh, I saw that Billie Eilish documentary and it was fantastic. I mean, and it, if you can't appreciate what she's doing from, and her brother too, who's the producer, like there's some unbelievable yeah. production and she's a really soulful singer, which is really what I gravitate towards the most from whether it's Otis Redding or Sam Cooke or Steven Tyler and Chris Cornell and Eddie Vedder, and Robert Plant and Jagger, like that soulful connection of, the emotional element of, of what they're singing about is, is what you're looking for. And she's got it um, in the, in the pop world. She's probably the one that has it the most for me now, but I, I I've been diving into bad flower a bit lately. Um, I've been listening to the new goodbye June stuff. They've got mm -hmm. some great stuff coming out too. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited for the rock scene coming out of this. Cause I think, I think the two sort of, genres that are going to really succeed after the coronavirus pandemic is rock and sort of like that EDM. Those two scenes are, are just, they're fun. Like they're fun environments, they're fun atmospheres to go to a show in. So I think nobody's going to want to get out of this and be really pissed off anymore. You know, they want to, you want to go and let loose and have fun. And, and I think those two scenes are going to deliver it for them. But um, yeah, I've just been listening to my playlist, man. And every time something new grabs you, you, you throw it on and you add it to your, you know, I do I have a writing playlist that I listen to and, uh, and that's sort of my go-to when I'm in the car or on, on the motorcycle or going for a bicycle ride, you know, here in town. There were two artists you mentioned uh, in there, one uh, being Bad Flower. Have you heard their new one, uh, F the World, because it's excellent? I haven't yet, but I will check it out. Highly recommend. And also Billie Eilish, uh, amongst her other stuff, her James Bond theme. And I think the movie's finally going to come out in November. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. But No Time to Die is an awesome James Bond theme. Awesome song. Awesome yeah. song. She, um, yeah, they knocked it out of the park with that one. Now, with you, you obviously like all sorts of different kinds of music and, and you, you, you know, you're trying to soak up things like a sponge. How do you take all of these things and put them into something that is your own, that is something original. Yeah. I mean, certainly I just think everybody's looking for authenticity and, and as a band, um, you know, it has to work with your band's chemistry, not only with each other, but, um, you know, individually there's gotta be, uh, your voice has to rear its head out somehow. That's, that's what we like about bands is, whether it's Rage Against the Machine or Aerosmith or Zeppelin, each really successful bands have every person in there has an element that's sneaking up at times and, and it creates a really unique sound. And that's, you fall in love with that energy. Um, you know, and certainly my influences come out vocally, I think here and there, whether it's in one song and not in another, it could, it could be in, there's a lot of different elements in a song like rolling sevens um, mm. that, that rear their head out. But yeah, I think uh, you're just looking for some authenticity in, in what you're creating and, and that can help you to just be unique, you know, add, add to the conversation of love or life or, you know, um, you know, loss, something like that. And, it is, and as long as you're doing it in your voice, it's going to be, it's going to feel fresh. Amongst the artists you named in that answer was Rage Against the Machine. That would be a, a, a great way to sort of bounce back to the subject of your producer, Nick Dedea, who has worked yep. with those guys. I would be curious when you first met him, uh, a while back and first started to actually work with him. Do you press him for anecdotes about folks he's worked with? Do you have a list of questions like, oh, man. how did you do this? How did you do that? What kind of gear did you like? Like, do you start peppering him with stuff or do you have to lay back and be cool? I, I don't know what protocol is for things like he, that. He's so cool. Um, he's so chill. And, you know, we, we were out there in Australia with him and there was plenty of time for storytelling, whether it was like, he's got, great stories about Springsteen and Eddie Vedder and Stone Temple Pilots and Rage. I mean, they recorded the Rage record in like a rehearsal space, you know, Evil Empire, I think it was. 
And, um, you know, and you learn a lot. It's like, especially about bands, his whole philosophy is like, just capture the energy. It doesn't matter. The, the guitar tones don't matter so much that the takes the perfection that you don't have to worry about that. Just capture the energy of the band and, and you'll be all right. And that's, that's what they did with all those bands from STP Pearl jam and, and rage. That's like certainly a constant thread through all those great records of the nineties. And, um, yeah, there are plenty of good little stories that popped up for sure. Now, when you talk about approaching recording like that, does that mean you've got a finite amount of time in the studio that day before things start to get a, a, a little crispy? You know, how, like exactly how many takes can you normally go for on the on the basic takes before you're like, oh, yeah, I'm playing this too many times. Like, like, like talk, walk me through a, a session and how that sort of thing would work. It kind of depended a little. There was a song, there's a song coming out um, on the LP called the wire that we played on tour a bunch. We played it almost, you know, for like six or seven months leading up to the studio and, you know, something like that. It's only like four or five takes. Everybody's like, yeah, we got it. It's yeah. fine. Um, and so much so that even like the scratch vocal takes I was doing just to perform with the band as they're trying to lay down their rhythm section. Um, I was like, yeah, it's fine. That's, that's done. Um, and then there's other ones where you're still trying to find like the magic sauce, you know, that, that missing ingredient that makes it amazing. There was one that we actually didn't find it for a tune called uh, rebel sun that we were really, everybody wanted to record it on the record. It, it was decided we were doing this song for the record. We all love it. And we just, for whatever reason, didn't execute it as well as we wanted to in the studio and decided to just move on. And, um, you know, it's still not done, done just because I think there's a lot more potential there than what we put on, uh, you know, that we, that we recorded. So, um, yeah, there's not a finite amount of takes. I think everybody just looks around and says, yeah, we think, think we're good with that, that rhythm take. And then John will lay some solos down and he'll start to feel good with it. And, and then I'll do the same with the vocals and then you're pretty much done, but it all comes from like a great riff or a great lyric. If you don't, have those things in place before you even start. You're kind of just spinning your wheels until you, until you get one of those elements, you know? How detrimental was it that you were not touring at all over the course of the last year, since that, that gig at the El Rey, uh, that you weren't able to get these songs out, even for a, a, a couple of odd live performances here or there to get them out to breathe a little bit. Did, did that really have any sort of final effect or it was a big deal? I like doing it that way. I love having shows to just test the temperature. Like, Hey, I think this is a good riff. Let's, let's test it out tonight and see how the audience just reacts. You know, you, you, they're never, their face can't lie to you if they're hearing it for the mm. first time. And so when you would play a song like the wire, it's a really fun rock and roll tune. And, and right off the jump, people are like really enjoying it. And the same with, tied up and we didn't get to do that with California dream. And I wish we had, um, but yeah, that's a great way to just see where the song sort of lags, uh, in energy or where you need to put, you know, this part here and just, it's a good test, you know, and, and you can go back and watch videos that people post and see, are they really digging it or not? And, uh, I I've always loved doing that. We, we go back doing that in bars, you know, we'll, we'll play black dog or whatever Zeppelin song and then play an original. And if the audience is still there and enjoying themselves after the original, you're probably onto something. Um, so I don't think we'll ever stop doing that. Um, <laughs> um, were there any times that you were trying to break in new material and it just died a miserable death and you thought, <laughs> well, let's, let's scratch this from the next session. You don't, you don't know those songs. They, uh, <laughs> they, there's, de <laughs> there's definitely, uh, yeah, there's been a couple that, uh, have gone, gone the way of the wind, I guess. Um, from just that, that same test, but not, not with this. It, we wouldn't play something if we weren't, certainly now we wouldn't play anything unless we were like, let's, let's see what you're thinking here. It's probably going to make it. If it might get adjusted after you hear it live the first time. Uh, but it'll probably make it to the end. If, if we get to a point where we're confident enough to play it on a tour now, you know, but and there's, there's still a song that I love. Uh, 
that I, I wrote several years ago that we used to play at the bars and I'm like, we should probably do this song. It's a really good song. And, and I'm still trying to convince the guys to do it with me. And I've always said the mark of a, a great song is if people are singing along with the chorus, the very first time they've heard the chorus, totally. then you know, you got something going on there. Yeah. I remember my buddy, um, my best friend from growing up, he came and watched us at a bar here uh, in Santa Monica a couple years ago. And he was like, it's hilarious to see people singing. I think we were playing when I'm gone. And, uh, you know, by the third chorus, people are going, all I wanted to say, you know, is I've been walking this line for too long. And they're, they're singing along to a song they've definitely never heard before. And he just got the biggest kick out of it. He's like, what the hell is going on here? It's hilarious. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, those are cool moments. Is Santa Monica where you grew up? No, I grew up in, uh, in, in New York upstate. Um, oh. but I met, I met everybody out here. Yeah. Um, and we just started gigging pretty much in Santa Monica. We religiously like stayed away from the sunset strip cause they had this whole pay to play format, except yeah. for the Viper room. They were always really cool. Um, and yeah, we, we just, we decided early on we were going to, go out and try and make a couple hundred bucks each night and play for four hours instead of playing for 30 minutes and pay the venue, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars to do your thing for 30 minutes. It was just a, it's a weird kind of backwards way to do it, but it worked out, I guess. So, well, no, you did the exact right thing. If you're going to go out and learn your craft, you can't do it with 20 or 25 minute sets. You've got to go out there yeah. and, you've got to learn your craft and that's four hours a night, you know, uh, b b retro rock people who have a good education of the Beatles will know about their time in Hamburg. Absolutely. And that's actually yeah. what made them a good band, you know? Yeah. And then when you, when you do start to do these like opening slots of like 30, 40 minutes, you know, opening for slash or somebody, it goes by in a blink and you yeah. are, you know, 30 minutes goes by and you're, you're just warmed up all of a sudden it turned into a bit of a, a weird thing where we had to take the 45 minutes leading up to the gig and really warm up together to be in that sweet spot when you hit no. the stage. So you, you mentioned uh, growing up in upstate New York. And again, you and I, I don't think in the times we've chatted before really went over histrionics and family and all that sort of thing. Tell me about your household growing up. Tell me about early music you listened to. Tell me about the first concerts you went to. I, I, I love hearing that from anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in kind of a broken household, but it was definitely a good one. My my parents split up when I was young. Um, I grew up with, I had a half brother, I had a full brother, I had a stepbrother and a stepsister, a stepfather. Um, it's pretty confusing, but uh, it was all very loving. Everybody was, you know, they're all my brothers and sisters. There's no, I'm, I'm close with every one of them. Um, but yeah, my, my dad got the record permanent vacation early on. We were doing hockey trips all over the Northeast. And uh, my dad had this tape, Aerosmith permanent vacation. He popped mm -hmm. it in and I, I fell in love with a couple of the songs on that record. And then my stepdad, maybe in, within the same month had toys in the attic. And I remember seeing these wings on this, on this cassette tape. And I was like, what the hell? It might've been a CD action. And then uh, I just remember because the record sounded so different it sounded like two different bands almost, but it had the same logo. And uh, I fell in love with Toys in the Attic. And, and then maybe a couple of years later, I saw Aerosmith. That was my first concert at SPAC. Got to meet them before the show, which was totally happenstance. They were at the radio station in town. And that was what really drew me to wanting to pursue music at a, at a young age. I got a guitar shortly after that and, you know, when you see Steven Tyler and Joe Perry signing autographs and getting to a limo and go to a sold out show in Saratoga. That's Springs, what I want to do. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty cool, uh, existence. Um, so yeah, they were my first show shortly after though. I saw ACDC, which was like even better, you know, yeah. honestly, uh, I saw them on the stiff upper lip tour and, um, man, I was just like, this, this is awesome. These guys kick ass. <laughs> They kick ass. They were the best band I've ever seen. And I saw the Stones growing up too. Just a lot of classic rock shows. Tom Petty was a big one that we would go to. Brian Adams. My stepdad really loved music and so did my dad. Um, my stepdad took me to a lot of shows um, growing up and that was sort of my 
my rock introduction to this whole crazy world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I would have to think upstate New York, you know, there's a number of large to medium sized cities within a few hours of each other. So that must yep. have been a, a concert. That must have been a target rich environment for concerts. Yeah. I think everybody <laughs> comes through either on their way to Buffalo or from Boston down from Montreal on their way to the city. Um, so, you know, we had an arena there and we had an amphitheater and, you know, all the big acts. Dave Matthews still goes there every summer. Yeah. Um, Tom Petty always rolled through and it was really crazy seeing the stones in Albany, um, you know, in, in the like 2010s or something. It was like, they're in Albany. That's great. They should be at a stadium somewhere, you know? Um, so, you know, it was, those are some very memorable moments. I still have like hearing problems from seeing ACDC twice in the same weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know what? That's worth 10 to 15% of your hearing. You I know? think it is. That's, yeah. that's, that's an even deal. Yeah. That's an even deal. Yeah. I agree. So I, I would have to imagine that at least part of the reason other than professional moving from upstate New York to Santa Monica, weather wise, it's, it's a big step up under uh under most circumstances. Uh, tell me about California dreaming, which seems to fit right into that. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a phenomenal song and there are a ton you. of songs about California, uh, but this one really stands out. Tell me, tell me all about the tune. Yeah. So obviously um, I was definitely familiar with the mamas and papas tune. And, and for whatever reason, I heard John's riff, which is a great riff, by the way. Um, one of my favorites that he's ever written. And I knew it the second I heard it, I was like, I'm writing something to that. And uh, for whatever reason, this melody, California Dreaming, da, 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 just popped out. And um, I was like, okay, that's interesting. It sounds good, you know, mm. but what's it about? And obviously when you sing that title out, you're aware of the Mamas and Papas tune. And I thought there was a different story to be told. You know, that song is basically just about, it, it's in the chorus. You're California dreaming on a winter's day, but California dream more often than not isn't realized. And it's, uh, I wanted to take a darker approach on this, this idea that, you know, some bad shit can happen out here and it's not all it's cracked up to be, even though it's this beautiful, wonderful place with some of the most amazing sites anywhere in the world, you know, it, it can definitely be a, a city or a, a state of, broken dreams and it sends people back with their tail between their legs. And that's sort of where I was going with, with it lyrically. And, and, you know, I wanted to give a little different twist. So it certainly owes more to uh, at least in its vibe uh, songs like uh, it never rains in California or yes. Do you know the way to San Jose, which are about, Hey, I'm going to LA. Wow. Yeah. LA kicked my ass and I'm leaving now. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's a very common tale. And I've had a lot of friends along the way that aren't here anymore that, um, you know, took their shot and gave up. So. And I love the video for the song. And, and the thing I'm dying to know is whose Mustang is that? <laughs> in the video i think that's a 68 fastback but i'm not sure i think i think it was a 65 i can look for you hold on no i don't think it's a 65 i don't think they have the fastbacks by then yeah I'm yeah you know what let's figure this out right now because i want to know i i love I mustangs it. and by the way uh your new album is uh is due out only six days away from the birthday of the uh the first ford mustang so i will look at that Oh, is sort it? of a bit of fortuitous kismet. The one I got was a 1965 fastback with an automatic transmission. It's named Francisco oh. after its previous owner from Santa Ana. I did. I didn't think they made fastbacks in 65. So I have no, it's pretty cool. I had no clue what I was talking about. Well, it, I'm, I'm I called up my buddy. Great. I called up my buddy. Cause I needed somebody to drive it out to the desert for me. It's a rental from this, this company um, in Costa Mesa called classic Mustang rentals. And uh, I knew, I just knew I wanted something older. I, I didn't want to rock and roll and like ads and product placement. It's just, I didn't want to go the route of like putting a new car in the video at all. I just wasn't my style. Yeah. So I called up this company and they were like, yeah, sure. We'll do it. Just have somebody pick it up and, and bring it back in one piece, obviously. 
And I called up a friend and I just said, do you, do you have any interest in, in driving a Mustang like three hours East uh, through Palm Springs and you can do whatever you want with it for the day, but it's just gotta be, <laughs> it's gotta be with me for like two hours. And he was like, I will definitely be there for you. So um, he was pumped <laughs> to do it. That's a, that's a bit of a dream job for you. But uh, yeah, we, we got it from them and they were great. I was a little disappointed. It, it had uh, not as much uh, jump as I was hoping. Well, also they sit low to the ground and they, they ride like a tank. I remember. Uh, yeah, uh, they do. What tour was it? It was Disturbed and Slipknot and they were playing in, um, oh crap. It was a place Bill Graham had built down by actually by San Jose, south of San Francisco. Anyway, I thought, oh, I'll be like Steve McQueen and and rent like a yeah. very cool Mustang driving around San Francisco where I was staying. And man, you can't see over the steering wheel anyway. And then you're on the hills and it's like you're driving blind. It's the worst yep. thing in the world, you know. San Fran's a top town to drive in. But yeah, Ooh, the yeah. um it didn't didn't have a lot of speed, that's for sure. But uh man, it was freaking cool to look at because we we sort of passed it as he was arriving we were on this long desert road and, and he was, he was arriving just as we were getting there too. And we're like, damn, that thing looks sick. And uh, he was like, he gets out of the car. He's stretching out his back. He goes, man, that was a long ride. And the tank, it's only like an eight gallon tank or something. So he had to fill up a couple of times on the way, but uh, it, it freaking looks cool. So. Well, that's a great story. And by the way, you know, back to the idea of the California dream, pretty much California is the only place they'll have places like rent a classic Mustang. Like that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. their business, you know, yeah. and they can make it work. I'm well, sure listen, as well, too. I'm, I'm, I, I love the new song. I'm stoked for the, the rest of the music to uh, to get to us eventually. And uh, I'm really happy to get some quality time with you. You and I have always ended up in big groups of doing things or yeah. quick hits at festivals. It's nice to sit and talk rock and roll with you. Yeah. You too. Always a pleasure. And uh, man, stay safe. We'll see you soon. I hope. Mark LaBelle, dirty honey talking rock and roll and Mustangs. It gets no better than that. <laughs> <laughs>